In 2006, the Pontifical Council for Culture, following its plenary assembly, issued a document called the Via Pulchritudinis, Privileged Pathway of Evangelization and Dialogue. So this document affirmed that beauty, the way of beauty, is the privileged pathway to evangelization and dialogue in our modern world. Beauty, of course, is a radiance of the true and the good. If you want to hear more about that, come to the talk tomorrow at 8 o'clock. And this document laid out the challenge of evangelization today as having to respond to the challenges of contemporary culture, notably religious indifference and unbelief. In a world in which it is said that people live as though God does not exist, beauty, we hope and we put forward, has the power to awaken the soul and to be a bridge to reach out to our contemporaries. Pope Paul VI, St. Paul VI now, at the close of the Second Vatican Council said, this world in which we live needs beauty in order not to sink into despair. It is beauty like truth which brings joy to the heart of man and is that precious fruit which resists the wear and tear of time, which unites generations and makes them share things in admiration. But we must aim, of course, to communicate true beauty. That is to say, it's not something that we stage or ignore the painful realities of life. Beauty is not mere superficial prettiness. The Pontifical Council said, the voice of beauty helps open ourselves up to the light of truth and enlightens the human condition, helping it seize the meaning of pain. In this way, it helps the healing of these injuries. Connected to these thoughts from the Pontifical Council, I want to offer to you the profound reflection of the then Cardinal Ratzinger in 2002. This is a speech, I would say a landmark speech that he gave in Rimini at the annual meeting of Comunione e Liberazione. And the talk is called The Feeling of Things, The Contemplation of Beauty, sometimes also subtitled Wounded by the Arrow of Beauty. You can find it online if you type Rimini Ratzinger or Benedict XVI, 2002. Well worth reading in full. But I cite this little passage. He said, the encounter with the beautiful can become the wound of the arrow that strikes the heart and in this way opens our eyes. And then contemplating the face of Christ, who is the beautiful one, he says, the one who is, the, who is beauty itself, let himself be slapped in the face, spat upon, crowned with thorns. However, in his face that is so disfigured, there appears the genuine extreme beauty, the beauty of love that goes to the very end. For this reason, it is revealed as greater than falsehood and violence. Whoever has perceived this beauty knows that truth and not falsehood is the real aspiration of the world. The beauty we communicate ultimately then is a person. It is Jesus Christ. And it's because we have allowed him to befriend us and because we have contemplated him that we can share his divine beauty with others. As the Pontifical Council said, in Christ and only in him, our via crucis is transformed into his in the via lucis and the via pulchritudinis. So our way of the cross is transformed into his in the way of light and the way of beauty. The church of the third millennium seeks this beauty in meeting with her Lord and with him in the dialogue of love with the men and women of our times. So 
what we do online and through social media, is to share our friendship with Christ. This basically, at its simplest, is what evangelization is. It's sharing your friendship with Christ. If you go to Rome, and you look at some of the earliest Christian basilicas, and you go, for example, to the Roman Forum, and that's the Church of Saints Cosmas and Damien, it has one of the earliest mosaics still surviving in a church. You see Jesus in the middle, and on either side, St. Cosmas and St. Damien, and St. Peter and St. Paul. And what's really charming is you see uh, St. Peter and Paul with, their, with one hand pointing to Christ in the center, and with the other hand wrapped around the shoulders of the saint, Cosmas, Damien on the other side. And what they're saying is, or at least I imagine them saying, come, let me introduce you to my friend. Evangelization, evangelization is, def is definitely then about befriending the one that you wish to evangelize, which raises serious questions for evangelization online, doesn't it? And yet, I found that often online, although I try not to be drawn into conversations, sometimes you have to be, and that's an opportunity to draw them into a kind of friendship, not with you, but with the Lord. We are never adequate to be friends with thousands of people, no matter what Facebook might say, right? And Pope Benedict XVI said very beautifully, there is nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak to others of our friendship with him. In this sense then, evangelization itself is the way of beauty because it, it, it invites us into the beauty of knowing God. Of course, we shall be using images as well as words appropriately matched to images to communicate online. Hence, it seems obvious that the photo should be beautiful. And we can look a little bit later on about how to choose a better photograph, okay? But the Pontifical Council says, to travel the way of beauty implies educating the youth for beauty. And if we're going to educate others, it's probably a good idea that we are educated ourselves first. So it means that as photographers, photo editors, and so on and so forth, we must first learn to see the beauty around us. We must learn in particular to see the beauty in the lives that we live together as a communion of saints and to see the beauty of our life lived in friendship with God. One of my joys as a photographer of religious communities, beginning with my own religious, with my own religious community, is that I feel I've been able to help my brothers and sisters to see the beauty of our life lived together as religious, and also to see the beauty of what we do, and above all, the beauty of their own faces. Because one of my many fears is that we religious, and maybe we Catholics, and we workaholics in Singapore, can spend so much time indoors looking at our books or more often staring at our screens or rushing to appointments that we forget to look and to see the beauty around us. And yet, natural beauty surrounds us and should be appreciated, as should beauty in what seems ordinary and mundane to us. As a photographer then, I feel I'm challenged to contemplate the beauty in God's created order, and to see all things with a fresh eye, or at least with a fresh lens. The Pontifical Council thus spoke of three ways, or three paths of beauty. The beauty of creation, the beauty of the arts, and the beauty of Christ and of his church. And religious life, which we'll talk a bit more about later, fits into that third category. At the start of the year for consecrated life, Pope Francis a few years ago reminded us that the consecrated life will not flourish as a result of brilliant vocation programs, 
but because the young people we meet find us attractive, because they see us as men and women who are happy. Similarly, the apostolic effectiveness of consecrated life does not depend on the efficiency of its methods. It depends on the eloquence of your lives, lives which radiate the joy and beauty of living the gospel and following Christ to the full. And what the Holy Father said about religious life, I think, of course, can be said for each and every single one of us, particularly if you're engaged in the work of evangelization. This is what we aim to share through our internet apostolate, the joy of living the gospel and of knowing Jesus Christ, of friendship with him. We are called, after all, then, to evangelize the digital continent. That's the phrase Pope Benedict XVI coined many years ago. Now, let me just, I'm a Dominican, so I'm going to do some metaphysics now, OK? You remember from the Easter Vigil, the first reading of the Easter Vigil. Anybody? Genesis. Great, Genesis. And there's a little refrain, like a chorus that comes again and again. God saw that it was good. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, interestingly, this is not about moral goodness as such, but something more fundamental. It's about metaphysical goodness, the goodness of being, the goodness of having existence, the goodness of participating in God who alone is good. St. Thomas Aquinas says, ex divina pulchritudine esse omnium derivato. From the divine beauty, all things derive their being. And so all creation, insofar as it has existence, speaks of this fundamental goodness, that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And when this deep goodness is perceived and even felt in our souls, we call it beauty. The quest of the photographer is to see this beauty and then to reveal it to others, to contemplate and to hand on the fruits of contemplation as one popular version of the Dominican motto would put it. So for me, photography at its best has a contemplative quality. It's the medium through which I perceive beauty in the very ordinary around me. And I don't just mean the food that's put in front of me. <laughs> I mean in the things that have become so familiar that their very creaturely contingency can be forgotten, their being has been taken for granted. It can happen with objects, with our surroundings, with the people we live with, and even with our life together in the consecrated life. As a photographer, then, I have tried to share something of the beauty that I see in God's creation, in sacred images and objects, and in art and architecture. Sometimes people tell me that the photograph is more beautiful than the real thing, which I think is not possible. If we see deeply enough into reality, we will see it is more beautiful than we could ever possibly depict. But a good painting comes close. But more precious than seeing the beauty of the created world around us is the chance to use photography to reveal to another the beauty of the human person, especially the beauty of one's own self. We live in a world where many people, notably among young people, who suffer from problems with their body image. Very often people, including my fellow Dominicans, and many who are not so young, try to avoid the camera. They're uncomfortable with being photographed because I think oftentimes we're not entirely comfortable with who we are and how we look. Many suffer from low self-esteem. And don't be mistaken, even the person who takes thousands of selfies they might still suffer from low self-esteem. It's not that they love themselves too much. They don't love themselves deeply enough. The Benedictine Cardinal Basil Hume, one time Archbishop of Westminster, once said that God is always looking at us because he loves us so much that he can't take his eyes off us. 
Now, a Dominican would understand this metaphysically in this way. It means that every moment of our existing, the very fact and goodness of our being is due to God's ongoing, sustaining love for you and for me. Indeed, St. Thomas Aquinas says, I think astonishingly, that the whole created universe, and we know, well, we don't know, but we are told how very huge the universe is, right? We never really know what it means. It's just a bunch of numbers, ultimately. But the world is so enormous and complex, but everything God has created, St. Thomas says, so that you, a rational creature, a physical being, might know the beauty and wisdom and splendor and glory and goodness and magnificence and so on of God. God wants you to know his love for you so much that he created this whole universe that the whole universe might sustain you. That's a pretty awesome thought. And I know the atheist would leap up and say, well, that's nonsense. But that's because he suffers from low self-esteem. <laughs> I know that God loves me and that this is true. What we want then is someone to look at a portrait of themselves and be able to hear God say, behold, you are very good. You are very beautiful. Seen in God's light then, every human person is beautiful and precious and loved into being. The photographic portrait that dares to show and even to reveal the truth of this is one that says, look at me. Look at how the Father has made me. I'm beautiful. Pope Benedict said it so memorably. He says, only if God accepts me and I become convinced of this, only then do I know definitively it is good that I exist. It is good to be a human being. If ever man's sense of being accepted and loved by God is lost, then there is no longer any answer to the question whether to be a human being is good at all. Just think, in our times, in the very utilitarian age, in which man has become a commodity, in which, as Pope Francis frequently says, human beings are treated as disposable objects. Our brothers and sisters no longer know whether it is good to be a human being, whether it is good that I exist. And when this happens, we know too that beauty is under threat because the beauty of God's creation is no longer perceived. Both in Laudato Si and Amores Letizia, Pope Francis said, in a consumerist society, the sense of beauty is impoverished, and so joy fades. Part of educating others in beauty means using photographs, where possible, to reveal the beauty that is present in people, in community life, in our interactions with others, and in our ministries, in living and being. It is the grace of Christ that makes us and our works to be beautiful. It is the grace of Christ that restores whatever has been marred by sin. It is the grace of Christ that refashions us into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. And so the Pontifical Council said, Jesus is the most beautiful of the children of men, for he possesses the fullness of the grace by which God delivers man from sin. A multitude of men and women have let themselves be seized by this beauty to consecrate themselves to it. What this means concretely is that we should capture and share images of the good works that we do, works that are done with charity. Often we can be hesitant to do this because of a misplaced kind of modesty. But recall this, in Matthew 5.16, the Lord says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, literally, if you look at the Greek, your beautiful works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. 
God's glory, therefore, and not our own, is the focus of our online apostolate. And if it can be said that our good works shine with light, then the job of the photographer, who is literally one who writes with light, his job then is to capture that light. That's the end of part one. Let's take a breather or a swig of water. So do we need to turn lights down or anything for the... No? Okay. So in what follows now, um, do you recall, some of you I think got your pen and paper out, the, the three paths or the three ways of beauty recommended by the Pontifical Council? So number one is... Number two? Us. And number three? Us. Huh? Us. Okay. Wow, I know I'm in Singapore because you guys pay attention. <laughs> okay. So we're going to start with then the beauty of creation. Okay? Photographs that show the beauty of creation. Can you see the Big Dipper? Okay. So in Laudato Si, Pope Francis invites us to see nature as a magnificent book in which God speaks to us and grants us a glimpse of his infinite beauty and goodness. In saying this, the Holy Father reminded me of the words of the Dominican St. Albert the Great, who says, the whole world is theology for us because the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The Pontifical Council document that I've been referring to also noted that the Franciscan tradition with St. Bonaventure notes a, sacram a sacramental dimension to creation, which carries traces of its origins. In this way, nature is considered an allegory and each natural reality as a symbol of its author. However, I find that if nature is shown with something more obviously religious in character, the image begins to tell a story. Human beings tend to connect with other people. So when they see another person in the frame, they begin to ask questions. What is she doing? What is she looking up at? What's the story here? An image like this tells more of a story than if it was just, um, OK, I can't cover it. If I did this, yes. Right? So the power of a good photo is to tell a clear story or at least contain some kind of narrative, I think. Do you think these are ugly? Few people think that flowers are ugly. And that's a reason for this. Written into the DNA of plants and animals, and thus as part of the structure of material creation, is one of the fundamental elements of beauty identified by the Greeks and the medieval philosophers. Symmetry, what's called patterned self-similarity. The universe as a whole is highly symmetrical. And the, phys the physicist Stephen Barr says, that symmetry contributes to the artistic unity of a work, to its balance, its proportion, and wholeness. But what if I add something, something more to this? So those white blossoms point here to the Immaculate Virgin Mary, to her purity. They form a natural crown round about her. So what I'm doing now is what I call um, visio divina. So we're using images, and I'm sort of leading you in a kind of guided meditation, thinking theologically about what we're seeing.
There is a hidden beauty in creation. In the autumn or fall, as the chlorophyll breaks down, the colors that are always present in the leaves are being revealed. Beauty is also seen in the ordered pattern of the veins, the shape of the leaves, their symmetry. Also in the shadow of the leaves behind, which are backlit. They're very ordinary. You see them, well, not in this country, but <laughs> in the States, for example, you see them every autumn. They're everywhere. And yet, what the camera does is to focus on them to make you see them again. But what if I add this? Then there is a sense of movement, of a journey, perhaps, in the religious life. We know it's a windy day, the movement and the habit and the leaves. Perhaps a sense of steadfastness despite the high winds. This photograph is an example of how photography can't do justice to the beauty of the reality. I went out after a great blizzard in Washington, DC to photograph the freshly fallen snow. I'd never come across, firstly, this much snow, and it was as fine as sand and it had the dryness of sand as well. And the wind would pick up the snow like fine dust. And you can see the streaks just about here, streaks in the sand formed by the wind. And then catching the morning light, it sparkled like so many jewels or stars. And the sunlight caught the snow that was thrown up by the wind and turned it to gold sort of turns golden in the light. It was quite enchanting. What does this say to me theologically? Anybody? The symmetry of every snowflake, snowflake speaks of divine order and beauty. But every snowflake, we're told, is unique reflecting the uniqueness of every human being, who, although sharing the same human nature, is formed, as it were, under specific atmospheric conditions, becoming unique and individual, lovingly willed into God, into being by God. And then the snowflakes were caught up by the wind, that is, by the Ruach Adonai, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. And we are caught up by the Holy Spirit so that the light of God's grace can shine upon us and turn us to gold. Because this is what grace does, divinizes us. Our human nature is alchemized, you might say, elevated and transformed by grace so that we become divine. But to this snowy landscape, what if I add this? Here we have a bunch of friars. This is in Alaska. It was minus 40. And they were shoveling around the outdoor shrine of Our Lady. They were also shoveling a path so that people could get to Mass. A beautiful sign of pastoral care, as well as piety and love for Mary. They didn't want to leave her shrine covered in snow. The heavens proclaim the glory of God, Psalm 19 tells us. What does it evoke for you? And if I add this, for some, it could be hope, the new dawn of the resurrection that's arriving. Others, maybe even sadness. Depends on whether you think it's a sunrise or a sunset. And then there is this. This is the Grand Canyon. It's the only 
time that I've come across something in nature that literally took my breath away. It was just, this photograph doesn't do it justice at all. It goes further than your eye can possibly see and there's much, much more of it and it's just truly magnificent. When you think how God has carved this out of the stone with water, really it's a sign of timelessness of God's eternity, maybe even God's patience. And then, if I add this, there's a contemplation, I think, of ma God's majesty and vastness, the vastness of time even, and man, his place in creation, his um, his diminitude, his hiddenness as well. Then moving on to the beauty of the arts. In 1991, Pope St. John Paul II said that the artistic patrimony inspired by the Christian faith was a formidable instrument of catechesis, fundamental to relaunch the universal message of beauty and good. Photos of art in our various churches and our religious houses can be used to catechize. Some of you may know that initially my interest in photography came out of uh, a desire to photograph stained glass windows because I was looking for colorful images of the saints and of the life of Christ and of the parables of Christ in order to illustrate PowerPoint slides for children when I was catechizing them. I didn't subsequently go on to use my photographs in this way, but the Dominican sisters in Nashville have a beautiful book published called Praying with a, guide, a Short Guide to Praying with the Family, and they used about 250 of my photographs, stained glass windows, all of them, to illustrate this book. And it's wonderful because this is used with children and parents tell me how much the children enjoy the colorful images. At the same time, the Pontifical Council also said that to reread the works of Christian art, small or great, musical or artistic, and put them back in their context while deepening their vital links with the life of the church, particularly the liturgy, is to let them speak again and help them transmit the message that inspired their creation. In other words, taking the art and beautiful things and putting them back into their liturgical context from which they were born is important. So photographs of people interacting in church with the art, using them as they're meant to be used as a means of contemplating truth and the gospels are especially powerful, I think. They remove art from the museum or from, things that, from the realm of things that we look at merely as an example of human ingenuity and they restore them to their proper place, which is to be instruments that direct us to give glory to God. These good and beautiful works are also meant to shine so that we give glory to our Father in heaven. And so what follows is a series of images of various liturgical artifacts are being used in their proper way, as it were. Again, there's a certain power. If I took that away, it's beautiful, of course, and powerful in itself. But this, there's a relationship that's opened up. And in fact, you're invited to join sister in contemplating the cross. Praying the divine office in a church. The cloister reclaimed as a place of contemplation and prayer. This, by the way, you might recognize from the first Harry Potter film. <laughs> this Durham Cathedral. So, not just a film set, but a place where we can pray. Pilgrimaging, 
and the use of sacred images in pilgrimages. Stained glass in a church. The veneration of relics. Devotional prayer before the saints. Personal prayer in church. the sacred liturgy. And here again, we see very well the interaction between the art and the liturgy. The art is always at the service of the liturgy. And finally, of course, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. You might wonder why I took it at an angle. I guess, it, it, partly to fit everything into the little frame, <laughs> but also kind of gives a certain dynamism to what could be quite a static image with a lot of formal symmetry. And finally, the third path, the beauty of Christ, model and prototype of Christian holiness. The Pontifical Council document states that the absolutely original and singular beauty of Christ, model of a truly beautiful life, is reflected in the holiness of a life transformed by grace. Hence, images of the consecrated life should bear witness to the joy and beauty of our lives, which are transformed by friendship with Christ. Therefore, the beauty of Christian witness expresses the beauty of Christianity and provides for its future. How can we be credible in announcing the good news if our lives are unable to manifest the beauty of this life, asks the Pontifical Council. In 2013, therefore, Pope Benedict XVI said that, in social networks, believers show their authenticity by sharing the profound source of their hope and joy, faith in the merciful and loving God revealed in Christ Jesus. This sharing consists not only in the explicit expression of their faith, but also in their witness, in the way in which they communicate choices, preferences, and judgments that are fully consistent with the gospel, even when it is not spoken of specifically. Thus, the photos we use, the way we present ourselves online, is all part of one single holy preaching all part of our common witness to the friendship we have with Jesus Christ, who transforms us and makes us beautiful because he is beauty itself. He is, in fact, the way to beauty. So there must be some kind of consistency between who we are publicly and how we behave. As an aside, quickly, if you've not read the documents that the Holy Father issues every year for the uh, World Day of Communications, they're all available on the, web, on the Vatican website, and I recommend them to you. In particular, uh, I mean, Pope Francis's are very, very challenging, um, but Pope Benedict's, I th I'm showing my own bias, of course, I think they're extremely beautiful and challenging as well. Especially the last one, famously, was about silence. And it's funny, day of communications and the letters about silence. And yet, it is the most important thing. Anyone here who has ever, uh, well, whether you're speaking or singing or engaged in making music, you know the value of silence, of the pause. It's important. If I didn't pause right now, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying, really. Because I'll be like, muttering, you know, when someone gets talked like that and they just put everything all together, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Although I believe it's a characteristic of Singlish to do that. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. In what follows then, um, I want to show you aspects of the consecrated life, which is the kind of life that I live and I've been privileged to, uh, to see 
many different forms of religious life. I've been privileged to observe as a friar and a photographer consecrated life lived in various communities. Back in 2016, um, I visited the cloistered Dominican nuns in Buffalo. It was a wonderful privilege because the nuns live behind the grill, as you know, the enclosure, and nobody is allowed to go in. And I had their former chaplain, a Dominican father, who came with me. And later, when I showed him the photographs, he said there were things that he'd never seen, even though he lived with them for 10 years. So I'm going to share some of these photographs with you. And they're not available online, because the nuns did not want their faces to be seen publicly. So bear in mind that we're looking at the beauty of a life lived totally given to God. Dominican nuns traditionally are nuns of perpetual adoration, and they're also nuns of the perpetual rosary. That means that they adore the sacrament, praying the rosary 24-7. Pray for Dominican nuns in your own country. They're a great gift. Part of their life is to go on processions around their cloister. Here they are in procession, singing and kneeling before the cross. And then in their choir, a life of study, principally the study of the Word of God, for which we need as well theology and philosophy to help us. Typical cell of a nun. Look at their joy. Their guests, these are guests coming to visit them in their parlors. They're not unhappy and they're very chatty once they start chatting. <laughs> this is where they eat, in the refectory, praying before meals. Extinguishing the candles after Compline, which is the last office of the day. This is their chaplain saying mass for them. He is outside the grill. And finally, where they end their days. Faces are important to telling a story. So where the nuns' faces are hidden, like here, the story is told through their symbolic gestures and their actions. For example, here you have a couple of nuns, two together. You see there's a sense maybe of consoling one another, a sense of community as they visit the rest of their community who is in the cemetery. And what's this all about? Is this a new burial? It raises questions, very interesting. But when it comes to the lives of the apostolic sisters, these are the Dominican sisters who live out in the world, and the life of the friars, we can show their life in general, but focus more on the faces and their interactions to draw people into the situation or story. So for example, these are apostolic sisters visiting nuns. Well, here they are praying together in Nashville, Tennessee. There are 197 of them living there. Well, this tells a story of sisters helping one another. As you get older, you find the bravery is very hard to use. <laughs> this tells a story of, again, of study in the Dominican life. But notice it's not direct, right? You see it through the mirror, or through the reflecting glass. Sisters teaching.
charity, that is love for others. The pastoral life, priests visiting with someone at home. Sisters engaged in making music, in fraternal conversation, and finally, contemplating the end of all things. In fact, the friars here are standing at the grave of J.R.R. Tolkien. That's the author of The Lord of the Rings. Okay, how much time have I got? Uh, what time am I finishing? 9.10. Okay, so 10 more minutes. Okay, good. So in the last section, um, we've looked at these three ways of beauty. And I said something about how the photographer is, has to try and find beauty in the ordinary. So I'm just going to show you some examples of that. So photography, that, photography is writing with light, right? So the photographer's eye is always on the lookout for the way that light changes our perspective on ordinary, familiar things. There are two moments in the day, at dawn and at dusk, when the light is at a low angle and turns golden, often called the golden hour. And one of the benefits, I think, of being an in-house photographer is that one can become familiar with the way that light moves in a building. And you can be around to capture the beautiful moments when the light is just right. I mean, this is, this is just grass with dew on it. This is quite ordinary, but I think that the way the light falls on the book, and it comes from the corner, and it reaches the other corner, so a diagonal, it's just right. And just enough interest there with the stained glass reflection just to draw the attention. So we move on now, finally. I've just been told I've got 20 more minutes, <laughs> which is rather more than I need, I hope. So I'm going to now have uh, some time with you, some interaction with you. We're going to make some decisions, right? So talking about telling a story, I'm going to show you some images, first one, then the other. And you choose and you tell me which one tells the story, OK? Okay, let's go. So this one, or this one. A or B? And be prepared to tell me why. <laughs> okay, A. Copy. It might be both. They might tell different stories. 
So who's willing to who's willing to speak up? Oh, come on. Anybody? There's a prize for the first one to go. <laughs> Someone right at the back. Oh. <laughs> good, good. You waited for him to come all the way to the front and then you put it. <laughs> I'm William Tan from uh, Risen Christ. Oh. I've been for 45 years. Wow. You should be here. I would say that it, uh, I would like more on these pictures. I, on my personal feeling as for Tarata, you see, the light shines on the first tree. Mm -hmm. That is a, it's a mid range. The four range one is on my right hand side, mm -hmm. and the background is a nun. Mm. And before that, there was also bright lights on the foreground. Mm -hmm. Which one? Uh, uh, this okay, one. Sorry, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this one. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. See, it tells different story and different parts of the picture itself. The flaming was good, mm -hmm. and the story it depends on the photographer how to express it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, he's right. I mean, um, I prefer the second one because it's a little bit more subtle, uh, and it, it I think it invites more of a story or more it gives you more scope to play with. The first one's pretty obvious as a, you know, a nun playing a guitar. That's the caption. <laughs> Whereas photographer spying on a nun playing guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually trying to not, you know, I knew that as soon as she saw me, she would stop. So I had to kind of stand afar off with a long lens and catch her um, doing this. What turned out was that she was writing a song about me, <laughs> which she sang at the last session we did together. So it was all very funny. <laughs> OK, let's move on. A or B? So you know when you're looking through your collection of photographs, you've got to make a choice. Which one will you choose, and why? I, I would pick this one, A, because there's a sense of closeness, a sense of intimacy. It's a, I feel like the lens is right approaching or entering into the midst of the conversation. So it feels like drawing the audience into the picture, and it's like, see what's going on. You know? Hmm. talking to themselves, they seem to be enjoying themselves, there's fellowship, there's camaraderie. It feels like you're a part of it. And you know, there's a sense of intimacy, closeness. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other one is like, oh just a picture of a few nuns gathering together in their part of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so this whatever's happening here, uh, I think it's what draws you in. Um, so this is what I said earlier about how people are drawn to people. And they start to make a story because they say, oh, they're having a conversation. I wonder if I can listen in. What do these nuns talk about in their free time? <clears throat> and of course, they're probably working out the jigsaw puzzle in front of them. Um, but yes, it is inviting. There's a certain communion of persons going on, and you're invited into that. Although that's not too bad, too, if you look at she's looking not directly at the camera, of course, but she's looking towards us. Sometimes people prefer uh, you know, someone looking at you. Okay. So this, or this, this, or this. It's quite obvious.
for me, would be the second one. You see yeah. the context yes. Yes. of where mm -hmm. they are, right? Okay. You see the cross and behind the um, There's a cross, right? Yeah. So you know they're kind of in their community, in their space, and and enjoying the view and the, the, the place and the conversation. Mm. Thank you. Anyone disagrees? I mean, the light is obviously a lot better than the second one, I think. I mean, technically, it's a better photograph, I think. Um, the framing is better, too. Um, and again, this interaction here draws interest. By the way, these are the Dominican sisters at Nashville, Tennessee. Um, okay, so this or this. Photos of priests and kids these days are very risky. <laughs> so choose carefully. You can say neither. <laughs> One or two. Okay, all those who say two, put your hand up. Oh, OK. All this to say number one? Ah, this is going to be fun. Let's have a little discussion. <clears throat> OK, number one, people. Explain. Okay, or at least explain why you preferred it to the other one. Um, um, I find that this picture, um, it shows um, a bit of everybody's face mm -hmm. compared to the second one, where um, the girl is totally turned and we get a blank full long hair. Mm -hmm. We know that it's a girl. Um, but the girl, the little girl, took away the attention of what is the main conversation. Yes. Yeah. So I prefer the first picture and yes. that first picture there is a conversation and um, everybody's paying attention. Even the tallest girl is looking at the priest for reaction. Yeah. Good. Okay. And those who chose number two? <laughs> Nobody wants to stand up for their choice. <laughs> I find that this picture, I mean, it kind of like mirrors Zacchaeus and the tree, Sycamore tree. So, as a Singaporean, I can relate to that girl. Because whenever people like, like in this talk, right, nobody wants to answer because we're being typical Singaporeans. We all don't want to answer and we're all scared of failure. And I think, like, like I, I can sort of relate to that and I sort of connect with that kind of, like, it, it's a kind of challenge to my faith also, in a way. So, I think that's the story of frame, yeah. Okay. Don't be afraid of failure. God loves you. Success. That's true. Can I ask, Father, is this uh, Father <laughs> Timothy Radcliffe? Uh, no, no, this no, is looks uh, like him. no, uh, no. He's in. Cal this is a Californian priest in San Francisco. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Father. Mm, yes. Sorry, just just to add to the contrast between the two pictures, I actually prefer the second one. Okay. Um, even though the faces are not as distinct, mm -hmm. um, simply because the first picture is a very conventional. Look at the behavior of the girls. It's very formal. Their hands are in front of them. Everybody's listening to the old white guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So you're either ageist or racist. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's very conventional in a sense because of the respect that people have okay. for religions and especially priests. Mm. But in the second, he's listening to something that mm -hmm. one of the girls is saying. And so it's a bit more engaging, and then that little girl who's clutching the lamppost, she's amused or she's listening, but mm -hmm. there's a little bit more mystery. I mean, they are, you know, their, their mouths are turned up, they're smiling, father is, can't all the oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, listening, but there's a bit more um, variety of reaction to whatever's being said than in the first picture, which is very 
everyone listens to. It's like that look on everyone's face when you go to class and the teacher or the principal walks in, it's that sort of place. Right? Okay, good, thank you. Okay, there's no right or wrong answer, right? <laughs> it, it all depends on the story you want to give. And, and that's the point. As photo editors or people who work in this area, you have to make these decisions all the time. And it's just interesting for us to listen to one another and hear how we can justify quite well and very, very reasonably the decisions we make. Okay. So, lastly, this one. I obviously didn't take this photo. <laughs> I think I didn't. Or this one. So like, this is like a post photograph. You want to sh so the brief is, I want to show a photograph of Dominicans and Franciscans together. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this one or this one or neither. Okay. So basically what I'm trying to get us to think about is post or unposed. So if the headline is uh, Dominicans and Franciscans share fraternal joy and you can only use one photograph, <laughs> which one are you going to use? <laughs> this one. Because of Ruro, uh, you said. Okay. Ah. <laughs> ah, yeah, there's no fooling you Singaporeans, la. Very clever. <laughs> Very good. All right. I want you to think of this one. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I was thinking about yeah. Because this is a nice shot, but there's a guy in between. Yeah. Oh. Whereas the other one's better because the person in between is Mother Mary. <laughs> she's full yeah, see? So, Mother Mary is better than some other. <laughs> You're very right. Spoken like a good Catholic. <laughs> Now the next one I'm going to show you, okay, is just to give you an example of bad photo editing. <laughs> what do these two, this headline and this photograph are completely unrelated. <laughs> I mean, it's not like he said that in Capri, I don't think he said it there, but even if he did, I mean, it's totally, you know. <laughs> if you didn't know what he was doing, You'd think that the chalice was stinking and he's holding it away from himself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And if you're on the lookout for it, it happens quite frequently in the press. And this is a Catholic newspaper, too. It's crooks. Just to name and shame. Okay. Finally. Finally, this was really uh, directed at our sisters and brothers in, in religious orders. How can, I found that a very good way to make an instant connection with people photograph, uh, through photography is to show friars, brothers, sisters, nuns doing ordinary things that the audience, the lay audience is familiar with. For example, playing sports of some kind. Or doing things, ordinary things. <laughs> I mean, look, if this was just some guy sitting on a um, lawnmower, you wouldn't really give it a second glance. Okay. Washing dishes. Uh, I should have had them in habit, but then anyway, they're cooking food. So fryers do that too. Or they work in the kitchen. Fries in a gallery. Shopping. 
<laughs> Saying bluegrass. <laughs> Talking to God. <laughs> Taking photos. And the last thing, whatever you do, have fun. That's a doorknob. Thank you very much.